Please turn this morning in your Bibles to Psalm 70. We're going to be in Psalm 70 this morning at Balfour. We affirm the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Psalm 70, the title of the message is, O Lord, do not delay. Let us pray together this morning. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to assemble ourselves together on this Lord's Day, to lift up our voices to you in praise. Lord, to give generously out of what you have given to us. And Father, now we have this time to open up your word. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we may see wondrous things from your law. Father, I pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Father, I pray that you would give me the grace and the strength to bring your word to your church. And Father, I pray, Lord, for the lost that may be among us this morning, that they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And Father, I pray for the Christian, Lord, I pray for your child that through this text, Lord, it would lead us to a greater dependence upon you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 70. The Bible says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, to bring to remembrance. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and confounded who seek my life. Let them be turned back and confused who desire my hurt. Let them be turned back because of their shame who say, Aha, aha. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And let those who love your salvation say continually, Let God be magnified. But I am poor and needy. Make haste to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Let us walk through the text this morning with ears to hear and a heart to obey. As we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As we begin this morning, I would like to ask you two questions, and I would ask that you be honest before God as you answer these questions. First, how would you finish the statement, in my distress, I cried too? Second, how would you finish this statement? I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from... How would you fill in? How would you finish those statements? Consider how these statements are finished in the Bible. The Bible says in Psalm 120, verse 1, In my distress I cried to the Lord, and He heard me. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord, who made the heaven and earth. Consider how the psalmist describes God in Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. With those verses in mind, look to the Bible, Psalm 70. We see that Psalm 70 is titled to the chief musician, a psalm of David to bring to remembrance. In this title, we see that the psalm is directed to the chief musician. This designation indicates that the psalm was to be used in worship in the temple. In this title, we see that the, the spirit-inspired author of the psalm, it is a psalm of David, a king of Israel, a man identified by God in Acts 13, 22, as a man after my own heart who will do all my will. In this title, we see the purpose of the psalm. It is to bring to remembrance. 
The context points to remembering by way of commemorating, by way of praise. This psalm is nearly identical to Psalm 40, verses 13 through 17, likely meaning that this psalm was brought out for emphasis as a reminder of who God is. Look to the Bible, verse 1. David petitions the Lord his God. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. When you see that word, make, that term, make haste, we might use the word hurry. David is calling upon his God to hurry. Why would he do that? To deliver him. That phrase that's translated there, to deliver me, the word is used 213 times in the Old Testament. It means to save. It means to rescue. The overwhelming number of uses in the Old Testament identify God as the deliverer, God as the rescuer. David needs rescue. He is calling upon the Lord to hurry. Why? To help him. David knows that it is the Lord is whom his help comes from. In Psalm 70, David shows us exactly what we must do when facing trouble. Go to the Lord in prayer. David's faith led him to the one he knew could deliver him and help him. David's faith led him to the one who was in fact his help and deliverer. David's attitude and actions demonstrate that he believed what the Bible says in Psalm 120 verse 1. In my distress I cried to the Lord and he heard me. Psalm 121, 1 and 2. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. Let me ask you a question this morning. Does your attitude and actions demonstrate that you believe what the Bible says? Does your faith lead you to the one you know can deliver you and can help you? Does your faith lead you to the one who is your help and deliverer? Do troubles leads you to cry out to the Lord. Next, David's adversaries are revealed. The ones from which he seeks deliverance and help from the Lord. Look at verses 2 and 3. Let them be ashamed and confounded who seek my life. Let them be turned back and confused who desire my hurt. Let them be turned back because of their shame who say, Aha, aha. David's adversaries, they seek his life. They are pursuing him with a desire to take his life. David's adversaries desire his hurt. It would bring them pleasure to see David harmed. David's adversaries say, aha, aha. Their goal is to humiliate David. Next, Look at David's specific appeal to God concerning his adversaries. David prays, let them be ashamed and confounded. David wants them to be embarrassed and humiliated. David prays, let them be turned back and confused. David wants them to turn away, having been disgraced. David prays, let them be turned back because of their shame. David wants them to be sent the other way as a reward for their shame. Dear Christian, please listen closely to what the Bible teaches concerning our adversary. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, please pay close attention to the contrast. The contrast that we see here between those seeking David's life and those who seek the Lord. Look at verse 4. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Do you remember David's prayer for those who sought his life and desired his hurt? He wanted them to be ashamed and confounded, turned back and confused. Yet, David's prayer for those who seek the Lord God is that they would rejoice and be glad in Him. The Bible goes on to say, And let those who love your salvation say continually, Let God be magnified. David's prayer for those who said, Aha, aha, was that they would be turned back because of their shame. Here we see David's prayer for those who love God's salvation was that they would say, let God be magnified. Let me ask you the question this morning. Are you counted among all those who seek the Lord? I loved how Barry would begin his sermons reminding us of Psalm 107 verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Are you counted among those who love God's salvation? Reflect for just a moment in humility, in thanksgiving, on what the Bible says in John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What about Romans 5, 6 through 8? For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What about 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What about Galatians 1, 3 and 4, grace to you and peace from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. And what about Ephesians 5, 2? And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We love God because he first loved us. There is no salvation apart from God's grace. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. As you consider that phrase, let God be magnified. Consider what we read in Luke chapter 1. God has sent the angel Gabriel to Mary. The angel says, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary then asks, How can this be, since I do not know a man? The angel says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that holy one is to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary then visits her relative Elizabeth. And we read in Luke 1, 46 and 47, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. 
as you consider that phrase, let God be magnified. Consider what we read in Philippians 1. The Apostle Paul is in prison. The Bible tells us that some are preaching Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to his chains. Yet writing of his imprisonment, we read in Philippians 1, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always so now, also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you are counted among those who love God's salvation, let the words of your heart, the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart proclaim the glorious words of verse 4. Let God be magnified. Let the following psalms be proclaimed from your lips, both in public and in private. Psalm 69, 30, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Psalm 92, 5, O Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. And Psalm 138, verses 2 and 3, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. Look to your Bible, verse number 5. But I am poor and needy. Make haste to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. David had first-hand experience of God being his help and his deliverer. In fact, if you look at the life of David, you'll see that he used past experiences of God's faithfulness in his life to stabilize him in present distress. In his battle with Goliath, the Philistine, he tells Saul, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. The closing of this psalm is an acknowledgement that God is the creator. The Bible says in Genesis 1-1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The closing of this psalm is an acknowledgement that men and women, boys and girls, are the created. The Bible says in Genesis 1.27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The closing of this psalm is an acknowledgement of our dependence on the Lord. We're reminded in 1 Peter 5, 5, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In the very next verses, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you believe that God cares for you. Remember what we read in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let me ask you another question this morning. Is there a care that you need to cast upon the Lord? If you are a Christian, One, having received the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, God is your Father. You are His child. The Bible says in John 1, 12 through 13 of Jesus, But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, 
to those who believe in his name who were born, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. God is your help. God is your deliverer. Believe the words of Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Follow the example of Psalm 120, verse 1. In my distress, I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. Follow the example of Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. As I was reflecting on the examples found in Scripture of God's help, of His deliverance for His people, the words of the author of Hebrews were brought to mind. The author of Hebrews emphasized the faith of Abel, Enoch, and Noah. He identified the faith of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. He wrote of the faith of Moses and Rahab. And then we read in Hebrews eleven thirty two, 32, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. You see, it's those words right there. Time would fail me. Time would fail me to give you every example in the Scriptures of God's help, of His deliverance, for his people. May I encourage you this week to read your Bibles. Read in the book of Exodus. There you will see how God delivered his people from the hand of the Egyptians. Read in 1 Samuel 17. There you will see how God delivered his people and his servant David from the hand of the Philistines. Read in Daniel 3. There you will see how God delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. You'll see a deliverance so remarkable that it led a pagan king to say, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Read in Daniel chapter 6. There you'll see how God delivered his servant Daniel from the den of lions he had been cast into. Daniel says in verse 22, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. Read in Acts 12. There you'll see how God delivered his servant Peter from prison and certain death. And as you read, you'll see that constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. It would also serve you well to read 2 Chronicles 25, verses 5 through 16. There you will see the acts of King Amaziah. He went to battle against the Edomites, and he slaughtered them. But he brought back with him their false gods. He set up their false gods and bowed down before them and burned incense to their false gods. He received a strong rebuke. We read in 2 Chronicles 25, 15, Therefore the anger of the Lord was aroused against Amaziah. And he sent him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of the people which could not rescue their own people from your hand? It would also serve us well to read Isaiah 44. There you'll see the foolishness of idolatry. You'll see clear instruction not to seek deliverance from false gods. They are worthless idols. As we close this morning, allow me to land squarely on our ultimate help, on our ultimate deliverance. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, 
For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The prophet Isaiah was one such man. He was moved by the Holy Spirit. He wrote of the coming Messiah. He wrote of the one who would come and save his people from their sins. The one who would offer help and deliverance. The prophet Isaiah wrote, the Spirit of the Lord. He wrote of this coming delivery. He was describing him. He said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, verse number 14. Luke chapter 4, verse number 14. You see, 700 years after Isaiah wrote those words that I just read, the birth of Christ had been announced to Mary. You remember the words of the angel? Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. You see, the Christ that Isaiah had told of, he had been born of Mary, the Bible says, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. As you continue on, you'll see the angel of the Lord announces to the shepherds who were living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. The angel says, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. We're then told in Luke chapter 2, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Jesus is then brought to the temple to be dedicated A man named Simeon takes Jesus into his arms and says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. We're then told of a prophetess named Anna. Upon seeing Jesus, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Israel. We're then told in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. We go on to read in Luke 2, verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. We go on to read that John baptizes Jesus to fulfill all righteousness. When this happens, we're told in Luke chapter 3, And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. Jesus is then tempted in the wilderness by Satan. Yet he does not yield. He does not sin. The Bible says of Jesus in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
Have you found your place yet? Luke chapter 4, verse 14. I want to remind you once again of those words written by the prophet Isaiah. He wrote of this coming deliverer. He wrote of this one who is coming to help. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Look now, Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? The words foretold by the prophet Isaiah of the one who would come, the one who would deliver, the one who would save his people from their sin. They were fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you still in captivity? Are you still in captivity to sin and death? Or has Jesus delivered you from sin and death? The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible tells us clearly what Jesus has done to deliver us from sin and death in 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Do you believe that? Are you holding to that as your salvation? If not, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you have not been delivered from sin and death, my appeal to you is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. If you're a Christian... If you are a child of God, if you have been ransomed from the slavery of sin, are you abiding in Christ? Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If you are in Christ, having been delivered, is he delivering you from fear? Is He your refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble? Is the Lord Jesus Christ living through you? The Bible says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. I have five quick requests of you as we close. These are not unbearable burdens that I'm laying upon you. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I have five requests of you 
as you walk out these doors this morning. First, seek God that you may rejoice and be glad. Seek God that you may rejoice and be glad. Through your words, secondly, through your words and actions, let God be magnified. Through your words and actions, let God be magnified. Third, demonstrate your dependence upon God by prayer. Praise Him. Petition Him. Intercede on behalf of others with Him. Demonstrate your dependence upon God by prayer. Fourth, reflect. Sit down. Take some time today. Reflect on how God has been and is your refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And finally, fifth, tell someone. Maybe somebody in your home. Maybe somebody, maybe you're going to be getting together with family in the next couple of weeks. Tell someone how God has been and is your refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Let's pray together. Almighty God, what comfort and encouragement and strength we draw from your word. Lord, what, what power and love and what a sound mind you give us, Lord, as we, as we look to you and we look to your word. Father, we thank you for these spirit-inspired words of Psalm 70. Lord, as we are reminded... Our hope, our help, our deliverance, it rests in you. Father, our primary appeal this morning is that if there's anyone here that has not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would do that today. Lord, they would acknowledge their sin and turn to you, seeking forgiveness through Christ. Father, we pray for the Christians that are assembled here today. Lord, oh, help us. Help us, Lord, to draw our strength from you. Lord, this life is hard. Lord, we're beat down each and every day. Lord, help us. Help us who love you, Lord, to rejoice. Lord, let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart to be that you would be magnified in us. Father, please draw us closer to you. Fill us with your grace and your mercy and your peace. And build us up and strengthen us as a church. Lord, that we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love our neighbor as ourself. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.